Good morning, everybody. Um, I thought we would be in a nice, cozy little classroom, and we could talk to each other and so forth. Uh, instead, we're in this cavernous hall. Uh, if you guys want to move forward, that would it might be more fun, um, just, just because this is uh, more fun as an interaction uh, rather than just kind of a lecture. So please do come forward. Uh, this is uh, Ron O'Bear. My name's Ira Wilson. Uh, uh, we'll introduce ourselves in a minute. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, uh, Ron and I teach a course called um, Healthcare in the U.S., uh, PHP 310, which is a course uh, that is in the initial sequence for uh, required courses for people who are public health concentrators. And what we're going to do today actually is um, sort of teach a class in a way, right? So rather than give you a lecture, um, we're going to talk about some things that we're talking about in class these days. Uh, and, um, and hopefully there's time at the end for questions. And, and by the way, please feel free to like interrupt, right? This, let's keep it informal. And those, those mics are on. So if you have any questions, just run up and ask a question. Or you can raise your hand. And so we'll keep it informal. But first, why don't I start? Ron, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, my name is Ronald Bear. I am, uh, this is my third year at Brown on this stint. I was here once before for a one-year appointment. I am not a traditional academic. Uh, I started my career at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta uh, as an EIS officer, and then I stayed on for another eight years at the CDC, and then I joined the health plan and, and a health outcomes research startup group. Then I joined uh, PBM, and then I worked in for a pharmaceutical manufacturer for a bit, and had a consulting company for another bit, and then I, and I came to Brown. This is one of the greatest jobs I've had, so very happy to be here. Yeah, it's really fun. I, Ron and I have known each other for over 15 years, and uh, for him to be able to come here so we could work together has been really thrilling. Um, I'm actually a physician by training. Uh, and I still see patients. Actually, I see patients at the uh, West Roxbury Vet uh, at the Providence uh, Veterans Hospital, which is a stone's throw from here. Uh, and I'm also the chairman of the Department of Health Services Policy and Practice, one of the four departments uh, in the School of Public Health. So, first of all, before we start, let me uh, just say I can't tell you how much I appreciate you um, uh, letting us teach your kids. Um, it is. Of all the things that I do and all the things that I've done in my uh, sort of longish career now, this is far and away the most fun. Uh, it's just really thrilling, and, uh, and it's because it's your kids. And so thank you very much. So the way we, the way we teach this class um, is um, we try to make it as sort of interactive as possible. Now, the class usually has between 300 and 500 people, which makes interaction kind of difficult. So what we do is we ask questions. Um, using software. And we can't use the software we use in class today uh, here, but we're going to use a different kind of software. Uh, and we start most classes with some questions. And so we're going to actually start some classes, this class, with some questions. OK? So has everybody logged in? So um, if you want more time, please let me know. It's, uh, you can either use the QR code or just go to menti.com and put in the Six-digit number. I'll give you. I'll give you a minute. Just, just raise your hand when you're all set and you're on board. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. So everybody ready for the first question? The number of hospitals and hospital beds in the U.S. is doing which of the following? Okay, interesting. So I, uh, I'm not going to tell you the answers just yet. We're going to get to the answers uh, in, uh, in what follows. And I'm going to do it that way because that's actually the way we do it in class. Um, and the reason I do it that way is because I want you all to be thinking as we go through the material, what's the answer to that question, right? Because it makes you pay more attention. Okay, here's the next question. Foreign medical graduates make up what percent of practicing physicians in the US? Yep. 
These questions were in uh, the beginning of lecture uh, this week. Interesting, it's not exactly random, but um, let's go to the next one. The average salary for a physician's assistant in Rhode Island is about what? A physician's assistant. <laughs> I was, because people can look what's going on, they can change their answers, which just means you know they're guessing, right? Okay, okay, this type of health plan has been steadily gaining market share in the past decade. So you can tell a group of parents actually buy insurance. <laughs> Hope you don't mind if I walk around like this. I can't stand behind a lectern. It doesn't, doesn't really work. Okay, next question. A fixed dollar amount that the insured person has to pay. By the way, we, we had an exam, uh, as you might have heard, uh, uh, the week before last. And the rest of these questions are actually from the exam. A fixed dollar amount that the insured person has to pay at the time of service is known as coinsurance. True or false? So I'm not going to actually cover this and what, um, what follows. So actually, it is false, right? It's a copay, right? So most of you got this right. Well done. The majority of Medicare beneficiaries are enrolled in Medicare Advantage. True or false? The average... The annual average cost of specialty medications is now 50% of the medium, median household income in the U.S. True or false? A few more questions in the quiz. Okay. CMS, which is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, currently does not negotiate drug prices with manufacturers and is proposing to do so with a provision included in the Build Back Better Act, true or false? Okay, looks like, looks like this was the easiest question. We're gonna have to make this a more difficult question. The probability that a prescription drug that is in phase one human trials progresses through phase three and is approved by the FDA is what? What do you think? <laughs> okay. And the last question, what one word best describes uh, how I think I did on this quiz. So how do you think you did? <laughs> okay, by the way, I forgot to tell you, um, the uh, Dean Zia authorized me to let you know that for every wrong answer, um, you're going to have 1% added onto the term bell next semester. <laughs> just, just kidding. Um, okay, can we go to the uh, slideshow now? Okay, so you did, uh, you'll, you'll see how you did. Um, actually, uh, I'm interested, uh, it seems like this uh, audience has a lot more general knowledge about these topics, actually, than our students. Um, okay. So I'm going to start off um, with, uh, can you all see this? It's, if those of you in the back want to move up, um, please feel free. It's, um, it's not exactly the easiest to see. So the, th the reason I showed this is this is um, sort of a pie chart of how we spend money in our healthcare system. And on the left is 2012, on the right is 2022. So it's like a 10-year uh, time difference, but you can see 2.7 trillion on the left, uh, a lot more, 5.1 trillion on the right. But you can see that the fractions 
that we spend on different big pieces um, are really not changed. So interestingly, hospital care, which is the reason I really showed this, is about 30% and has been about 30%. Uh, and no matter what kind of insurance you look at, it tends to be about 30%. Uh, that's the dark blue. And then to the, if you go around a little further, sort of 4 to 6 o'clock, physician and clinical services, about 20% of health care is almost always on, spent on doctors, and then about 10% or so on drugs. Okay, so many of you actually uh, got this right. Um, I, you know, the answer I thought was, uh, was it, it's going down slowly. So this is um, the number of, this is use of hospital beds. And you can look this a variety of different ways, but the best way to do is actually to look at hospital days. And you can see this is inpatient days per thousand persons, so adjusted for the population uh, over a big time interval. And you can see that's drifting down. And you might say, well, okay, so that's drifting down. So that means hospitals have less to do. So what are hospitals doing instead? And the answer is, they're going into the outpatient care business, right? Did you all know this? Those of you who are doctors knew this. Um, and this is, uh, one way to look at this is you can see this is over another 20 year time period. Uh, and you can see the gross inpatient revenue, revenue, which is the light blue. You can see over time that's getting smaller. And the dark blue, which is outpatient revenue, is getting bigger, okay? Now, we're going to come back in a minute to why that's important and why you should worry about that and be concerned about it, or at least be interested in it. Um, those of you knew that high deductible health plans are the ones that are growing the fastest, uh, and you can see that the, the high deductible health plans are, are the dark blue way over here. Unfortunately, I don't have a pointer. Uh, way over here, you can see this has gone from 4% to 31%. So literally 31% of all the health plans sold now are high deductible health plans, and you all know this. How many of you actually have high deductible health plans? Good for you, right? Because it actually takes a little courage and a little organization to, uh, to figure out how to do high deductible health plans, and even for those of us in the industry, it's not, it's not all that easy. So the reason that I wanted to talk about hospitals is because you all have to make decisions about buying things in that high deductible phase. So let's imagine you need a colonoscopy. Do you, can, can we all agree colonoscopy is kind of a reasonable, straightforward, kind of common thing? So let's just look um, at a colonoscopy. So the questions to think about is, if you need a procedure, how much is it gonna cost? By the way, do you ever know how much it's gonna cost? No, it's a disaster. Right? So how can you be a smart consumer in a high deductible phase when you don't know how much something costs? Then where should you get it? Uh, and I'm just going to give the example of a colonoscopy. Now, this is sort of complicated data. There's a very straight straightforward message. This is data from 2019 in Rhode Island in commercial health insurance. And you can see here, HOPD is hospital outpatient departments, right? The, the, those are the people that are doing a lot more business now, right? That was the dark blue. Um, bars. And over there is uh, ambulatory surgical centers. That's not in hospitals. And you can see this is cost. This is how much it costs to get a colonoscopy in those places. You can see this number is a lot bigger uh, than the ambulatory surgical center number. I don't know, you probably can't see this. The mean for the hospital is $1,600 and the mean for the ambulatory surgical center is a lot lower, $849. Right? But look at the price variation. You see, those, you see those dots? So a colonoscopy in Rhode Island might cost you over $8,000, it might cost you $6,000, might cost $4,000, or down in the lower middle part of the distributions. So there is a wild distribution in commercial insurances of how much you have to pay. When does this matter? It matters to you in your high deductible phase, right? And that's why I'm going through this. So what is the problem? So that's why I showed the, the graph on the other side. Um, <clears throat> so hospitals have two kinds of charges which are in the bill. One is the bill for doctors, and the other is the bill for, it's called, for, they're called facility charges, okay? And um, it, it turns out, you see, the, the, the blue over there on the right-hand graph is the same thing as, uh, as on the left-hand side, it's total charges. But if you look at the red, um, those are, that's how much um, the doctor fee is. And you can see that the doctor fee is the same whether you're in an ambulatory setting or a hospital setting. It's the same. What's the difference? It's that green part, which is the facility fee. 
Look at how much bigger the facility fee is for the hospital outpatient department compared to the ambulatory surgical center. And also, um, look also at how much it varies. So it's wildly various, right? So what does this tell you? It means if you need a procedure and you're in your high deductible phase, where should you look to get that procedure? Not in a hospital outpatient department, okay? Huge difference. So that was the whole point of this. Uh, actually, I didn't teach this to the students, but I thought you all who have to make decisions in the high deductible phase would be very interested. Um, and hospitals don't want people to know this, right? But this is, uh, now, now you are on the inside, right? You got this secret info. Okay, now we're gonna talk, switch gears very briefly to talk about uh, international medical graduates. And you, this is unfortunately, you probably can't see. So this is the percentage of active physicians who are, in interna who are international medical graduates. And the, the darker where there's more, right? So you can see New York, Florida, Texas, Nevada. Um, um, <clears throat> this, is, this is where there are more, um, uh, foreign medical graduates. And this looks at it by state. Uh, and you can see there's sort of literally fourfold variation in the number of, fourfold med of, of foreign medical graduates in places like Montana and Idaho versus New Jersey uh, and New York. And you can see that middle number, that's a median, is about 20. So on the quiz, the actual mean is about 24%, right? So about 24% of all the doctors in this country are actually foreign medical graduates, uh, which is very important. And by the way, and just in case someone's wondering, there have been some very nice recent studies done of the quality of the care provided by those foreign medical graduates. Those studies, actually the senior author was Ashish Jha, who's the Dean of the Public Health, uh, School of Public Health here at Brown. Absolutely no difference in the quality of care provided uh, by those physicians. And I just wanted to point out one other thing. Uh, this is data um, with years across the bottom, uh, and these are the number of certificates issued by the Educational Commission for Foreign Med Medical Graduates. They're the ones that basically take the people who've graduated from a medical school outside the US and make sure that they're trained and able to be do a residency program uh, here. Um, and the one thing I did want to point out is you can see right over there, Trump's immigration policies had a really chilling immediate effect on the number of foreign medical graduates who could come to here uh, to this country. Okay. Uh, and this is one other thing I'll bet a lot of you didn't know. Um, so this is the number of foreign medical graduates over a long period of time and where they're from. And if you look at the blue line on the top, you can see that most of the foreign medical graduates are from what foreign country? The US. And number, number three, right, right after India, is actually Canada, right? So a huge number of the quote-unquote foreign medical graduates are actually Americans or Canadians who are practicing here. Now, why is that? Does that make sense? What's going on? It's because Americans go to medical school outside the United States, then they have to come back and they're treated as if they were not Americans, right? Because they were trained in a different place. Um, I bet, but I bet a lot of you didn't know that. Um, I'm gonna switch, gear, uh, switch gears a little bit here um, and to talk very briefly about the the characteristics of the, worst, the workforce here in this country. And I asked a question about physician assistants, and that was just a sort of a little a bit of an excuse uh, to talk a little bit. Uh, this is from the New England Journal. Uh, growing ranks of advanced practice clinicians, implications for the physician workforce. So physician assistants and nurse practitioners are advanced practice clinicians. Um, and this is a, a table uh, that just shows 2001, 2010, 2016, and then a projection of 2030. The first row is physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants. You can see over here uh, that this is annual growth rates. And you can see that the number of physicians in this country is not growing very fast. In fact, it's barely growing at all. And by the way, that's why it's really important for us to be able to get foreign medical graduates into this country, right? Because we aren't training enough here. Uh, but you can also see, look at the growth, rate, growth rates of nurse practitioners and physician assistants. So these are interesting jobs um, in the expanding job markets. So how much do physician assistants make? This is the one question you all mostly blew it, right? So actually, in Rhode Island, a physician assistant makes $112,000. And this is actually old data. It's probably uh, at least $10,000 more than that now. So physician assistants make good money all around the country. 
Uh, and uh, let me just tell you that many of your students are, are interested to learn this, that they can actually make, a good money, uh, make good money in healthcare without necessarily spending $400,000 to go to medical school. Not that most of them won't do that anyway. Um, so this is the question about Medicare Advantage. Um, and the question was, uh, you know, most of the people in the Medicare program and Medicare Advantage, that's the majority. It's not really true, but look what's happening. This is over time, and you can see the percent of Medicare beneficiaries. The, the bar graph is actually the number, but the, below you can see the percent. So enrollment in Medicare Advantage is going up and up and up. Um, and for lots of reasons. One, it's a little less expensive. Two, it's a little simpler. And three, the quality of care continues to improve. Um, but it's now at 39%, so it's nowhere near a, major a majority just yet, although if you project out, project out three, four, five years, it may be there. Okay, I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleague, <laughs> Professor Aubert. Good afternoon. So, uh, before we, before we get to a couple of graphs, uh, I asked you about specialty. So we got to figure out what the heck is specialty. And specialty is not really a drug category. It really is a distribution channel. And it, if you think about brand name drug, are those that you see on television or advertised, made by the main, major manufacturers, Pfizer, and Merck, AstraZeneca, et cetera. Uh, and then a generic medication is one that is the exact same as a as a brand name, but it's, it's used, they're, they're after a brand name medication has lost its patent life, and anybody can make it. And there are, there are, met, there are companies out there that just make um, generic medications. We're gonna skip biologics and biosimilars for, for this class and come down to specialty. Um, so specialty is designated by the payer for special, for, to be in the special specialty category. They tend to be high cost, they might require special handling, whether it's refrigeration, whether it's radiation, whether it um, needs to have special instruction or be administered in, in the fusion center. Um, but uh, they tend, but the, but the first characteristic is high cost. And so that's the thing that becomes most discerning about specialty medications. So the question about, and, and the thing that keeps the payers nervous is how much the trend in terms of the cost of specialty drugs is changing over time, and, and changing quite rapidly, actually. So the blue bars, which you can barely see, or just hugging the bottom, that's, that's the trend in generic prices. And that really hasn't changed or has actually declined over the last 10, or this particular graph, five years, where you can see especially the trend has, has doubled and to the point where it now exceeds the average treatment the average cost of a specialty drug annually exceeds the median income. In 2017, 78,000 was the was the average cost of a specialty medication annually, compared to 60,000 um, median income. So that's that's the category that people want to take keep an eye on. If you're a payer, that's, that's the category that you worry about. Oncology is is most of the drugs in oncology are specialty. Rheumatoid arthritis, some of the um, uh, drugs that are actually biologics would end up in, a, in the specialty category. Build Back Better legislation. Most people got this one right, but I'm, but I'm going to say that if you said, so again, um, Part D, everybody understood that that was, uh, for Medicare Part D, um, CMS was prohibited from negotiating directly with manufacturers on price. Um, so under the subtitle J for the Build Back Better, Act, uh, it directs the Secretary of the Department of Health, Human, uh, Health and Human Services to establish what's considered a fair price negotiation program um, to reduce out-of-pocket spending for prescription drugs. Now, the negotiations are really going to be confined to about 250 drugs that they feel do not have adequate competition. And then every year they might add some other uh, drugs to that category. That's the proposal. So it's not it's not a sweeping negotiation of price. It's only for those that um, they, they think don't have um, adequate co competition. So it, the answer to that one could be sort of. So, and, and the expectation is there's going to be about $100 billion in savings by, um, by, by 
the government being able to negotiate price with manufacturers and that savings they're depending on to pay for some of the other things that are going to be included in the bill. The question about um, the likelihood that a drug goes to, uh, goes, goes to approval is an interesting one. So in the bottom half of this chart, these are the different phases of drug trials. So if a drug starts in phase one, these are human trials, it's a 59, or almost 60% probably that it'll progress to phase two. If it starts in phase two, 35% chance that it'll progress to phase three. If it makes it to phase three, 62% that'll make it, that'll get, uh, it'll get submitted for approval and get approved, 90%. And then overall, that's about 11.8%. So people that said between 10 and 12% were correct. Oops. So I'll turn it back to Ira to tell you about the medical provisions in the Build Back Better bill. Great. Thank you. Um, by the way, uh, raise your hand if you have something to do with the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> I want to be represented. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No comment. Um, so, so right now in Washington, if you're following these negotiations, there is, um, there is in, there's an intense struggle going on between um, the, the pharmaceutical industry and all the lobbyists that they've hired uh, and, uh, and a variety of senators and representatives. It's very, very intense. There is vast amounts of money that are moving back and forth. Uh, and I would really encourage you to, um, to keep an eye on this. Um, so right now, this week, uh, I, I didn't know whether there would be some resolution. Uh, last week there wasn't. Hopefully there'll be some kind of a re resolution this week. Um, we are deciding right now as a country, literally, what we want to do with infrastructure, both physical infrastructure and social infrastructure uh, for the next decade in this uh, in this country, and um, so far, it's not at all clear what's going to happen. The about 600 billion out of the original uh, 3.5 trillion dollars in this, it, not in the physical infrastructure, but in kind of the social infrastructure part of the Build Back Better bill, uh, was healthcare. 600 billion. Now, that 3.5 trillion has sort of shrunk, right? It sort of looks like. It's going to be two trillion at best, or maybe even smaller than that, or maybe not happen at all. Um, but but let me just mention a couple of things that were in that uh, and that are being discussed. So there are changes to marketplace plans, to Medicaid, and to Medicare. Um, the, this is a, an infographic actually from the White House uh, website, um, and I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that the um, the American Rescue Plan Act that was passed in March. Among other things, remember, a lot of people lost their jobs uh, with COVID. And when they lost their jobs, what else did they lose? Their health insurance, right. And so what the, one of the things that this that did was it created um, uh, a special enrollment period or an SEP so people could enroll in the marketplace plans and made it more advantageous for them to do so. And indeed, if you look at the second column there, 2.8 million people enrolled in marketplace plans um, between March and right now. Th these were data that were released by HHS uh, literally in September. 2.1 million of those were kind of in the, uh, the federal marketplace plans and, and uh, uh, the rest were in states. Uh, and also, um, they actually, part of what that money did was pay for people to get lower premiums. And so they actually, a lot of money was saved. And, and this is kind of busy, but the main thing I want you to look at is the fact that if you look at that middle column, it says pre-ARP 2001 premium percent, that's the percent of income that people were expected to pay um, to get insurance if they were in the income categories that are in the orange. And if you look over the post-ARP 2021, you can see they're all smaller. So if you were below 150% uh, of the federal poverty level, you didn't have to pay any premium. And also, very important, if you look at the very last row, over 400,000, so people who make over 400,000% of the federal poverty level are not eligible for any kind of subsidies on the exchanges. Well, that changed to uh, 
to um, making them pay at most 8.5% of their income with, um, uh, with the act. And so the point I was trying to make is that um, the idea of the Build Back Better uh, Act related to this is to continue these. So people continue to uh, be able to uh, buy insurance and buy them at better rates. So that's part of this. There's a couple of other things that have to do with the marketplaces that uh, aren't that important. Um, but let me just turn quickly to Medicaid. So part of the point of the Medicaid features of this is to close what's called the Medicaid coverage gap. Uh, and I, I dare say most of you have not thought about what the Medicaid coverage gap is. But this is, this is a problem in the states that have not expanded their Medicaid programs. Okay, this is not an issue if you have expanded Medicaid. And what this sort of schematic shows um, is in the dark blue, um, those are people who, whose, whose income in those states that didn't expand qualify for them for their Medicaid program. So they have no problem. They can get Medicaid. Not all of them have it, by the way, but they're qualified for it. And then, um, then you've got people in the light blue up on the right, and it says currently eligible for marketplace coverage. So those people, um, as long as you make more than 100% of the federal poverty level in those states, you can get insurance on the marketplace. Now, here's the kicker. The people in orange, 2.2 million people, can't get insurance anywhere, right? They make too little money, strangely, uh, to be able to buy it on the exchanges, but they make too much money to be able to buy it through, to get it, be eligible for it through their own state's Medicaid program. And by the way, those 2.2 million people are almost all from three or four states, mostly Texas, uh, in Florida, but also some Georgia and some North Carolina, right? They're almost all from four states. And by the way, they are um, differentially African American. Um, so this is, um, th 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 this, this process creates racial disparities or, or perpetuates ra racial disparities, among other things. So the idea is to basically fill that orange so those people can get insurance. Um, and uh, two other things, it wants to, uh, it, it proposes to permanently extend the children's health insurance program, which everybody likes and gets reauthorized again and again, but this would make it permanent. And l lastly, I don't know how many of you know this, but if you are in many states, if you are a pregnant woman and you qualify for Medicaid because of pregnancy, your coverage ends 60 days after the pregnancy ends. Did you know that? Do, do, what do you think? Do women have health care needs that, that last more than two months after the, the end of their pregnancy? It's a silly question. Of course they do. And the idea here is to extend this through one year postpartum. This is something that's been recommended by every professional organization that has to do with uh, maternal child health. And lastly uh, is Medicare. Uh, 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 Ron talked about the first point. And the second point is, and Senator Sanders has been very um, vocal about this. He wants to add coverage for vision, hearing, and dental services to, medical, to, to Medicare. So who knows what's going to happen with that. Um, but that's all we have to say here today. And uh, we, were, we actually purposefully left time for those of you who want to come up and ask uh, questions or create conversations among, uh, among uh, any of you. So we're done. Uh, and the, the we turn the floor over to you. Uh, and those microphones are on. It's a great presentation. Uh, Medical Society of New York recently sent out an email uh, telling physicians to, quote unquote, keep an eye out on uh, the retail um, uh, medical practices, such as CVS, Minute Clinic, and Walmart, and all these big players uh, uh, ramping up. So any predictions as to what, how that would change the landscape? <laughs> so, so we're going to have a lecture on that this coming Friday to the class. Ron, do you have any, anything you want to? No, so jump in. So, so, so I, everybody should know that, um, that um, you know, Kroger's, CVS, various big box stores are trying to sort of integrate into the healthcare business. And it's not to actually replace primary care by and large. It's to replace the parts of primary care that are sort of simple and straightforward vaccinations, treatment of colds, and things like this. Um, 
And it's really very interesting because you might ask yourself a question. And by the way, the, the, the number of you know, minute clinics and places like this are, are going up all over the country, right? They haven't flattened. They've gone up. It's a growth industry. Now, I'm a primary care doctor, right? Uh, I believe people should get care from their primary care doctors where all their medical records sit and where they can discuss the pluses and minuses of one thing or another. But there's a reason why these other things are going up in, in popularity and prevalence. And the reason is my profession, primary care doctors, do a crappy job staying open when patients need to be seen, okay? So by and large, primary care offices are not open evenings. They are not open on weekends. They are certainly not open on holidays. So the point is, people need to be able to get health care when it's convenient to them to do so when they don't have to basically get fired from work for leaving. Right? So what I would say is that traditional medical care systems have done a terrible job figuring out how to make the, the care they provide and access to it <clears throat> convenient. Big problem. So I don't know what's going to happen. <clears throat> Great question. Are you a physician in New York? <clears throat> Other questions? Nice presentation, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, question is, a uh, lot of primary care physicians or private physicians are now employed physicians, and there's a lot of consolidation in the hospital systems in the various markets. Uh, has there been any data about the, how it's affecting the healthcare costs? <laughs> this is a great question, right? So let me just say the question in case everyone didn't hear. So he was talking about consolidation um, in general in healthcare, but particularly among primary care physicians, but also among hospitals. And by the way, there's also consolidation among payers. Most of you who are physicians, if you think about how many payers there are, how many insurance companies there are actually in your area, usually it's two or three. Can you have competition with two or three payers? Not really. And the payers can't have competition if there's only two or three hospital systems either. So there, there is a lot of data, and the data is really very strong. When, in healthcare, when mergers happen, the arguments that are made to all the antitrust entities are that this is going to increase efficiency, right. reduce costs, and ultimately pay off with lower premiums and lower prices for consumers. And it turns out that is just false. It's never true. Mergers raise prices, and that's all that they do. Uh, now, there might be a few exceptions here and there, but there is very, very good work by health economists that shows that. Now, let me just mention one other thing, sorry. There is a reason why physicians are joining larger groups and larger entities, and that is because the payment game, um, ACOs and alternative payment models, all require scale. Uh, so you can't really participate effectively in a lot of the newer payment models uh, if you're just in a small practice of two, three, four people. So it's, it's, it's not, it, it's, you know, there's very good reason to try to do that, even if ultimately um, it may not actually reduce prices. Go ahead. Oh, um, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to say I'm in healthcare in the U.S. and I'm really enjoying the class. So thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you very much. I have a couple of questions, but the first one may be pertaining to students here at Brown or in other uh, colleges who are studying to be in some kind of health care profession, whether it be a physician. How does um, the interplay of here specifically at Brown as an example, your, the, the School of Public Health kind of play into a student who is thinking of going into like biotech research and how policy changes and shapes that or someone who's thinking of becoming a physician but now, you know, maybe should go into hospital administration because the change in salary there is uh, vastly, you know, uh, outpacing uh, medical salary. So I'm wondering how that the public schools integrated into the learning of, say, a, a first year or second year student who are in those specific fields uh, in broad healthcare and how how they're cognizant of how health services and policy shapes what their ultimate career decision will be and how Brown kind of tries to play that or interweave those things together. Yeah, you know, Ron and I both do a lot of advising of students. Ron, well, how would you answer that? Yeah, I, I would say that um, one of the things that we try to do is, uh, is 
in some of our course offerings is to make sure that we we um, identify. So the, I teach another class that's just focused on pharmaceuticals. It goes from the manufacturer, everything happens in between, down to the patient, down to the patient. And one of the things that I do with that class, I bring in people who are in industry. And I think the one thing that we don't understand about healthcare is how nuanced it is and how vast the opportunities are. And so I think um, uh, from an advising perspective, one of the things that I do is to try to, because not everybody wants to go to medical school, but people have no clue about what the range of possibilities are. And that's, that's where, I, it, for students like that, that's a great conversation for me because I've touched so many uh, spaces in healthcare. And I think, and I think the changes that you will see in the school over the next few years will also reflect um, uh, sort of the diversity of possibilities within health and healthcare. So I think um, so. I, I think the school was really trying to, uh, and certainly the, the, the diversity of the faculty is trying to really give students a perspective on the range of possibilities. Yeah, I would just say one of the goals of the course, and for students um, who, who are taking the course, I think you appreciate it. One of the goals is to help people see how vast, you know, it's, it's one-sixth of our entire economy, and there's so many ecological niches in there that no matter who you are and no matter what you like, no matter what turns you on, there's, there, there's potentially a niche for you and to not think about it in a narrow way. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Great lecture, by the way. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your time on a Saturday morning. So uh, you presented some data that says that the cost of medical care is increasing. Um, you've presented some data that shows there's a lot of consolidation. Uh, we know that a lot of physicians are no longer in private practice. They're now hospital employed. They're employed by private equity. United Healthcare owns 53,000 physicians right now. So what is the government doing, or what should the government do, in your estimation, to try and preserve private practice, to preserve the competition, and potentially give patients more choice so that they're not a victim of corporate medicine and maybe to keep prices down? So that's what, the 20 second question? Yeah. Um, you know, I'd actually like to throw it back on the audience here. I mean, this, these, are, these are sort of existential questions, fundamental basic questions um, about, uh, about what is gonna happen over time. Um, in our healthcare system, let me, and I don't, I can't answer that, but let me just say that um, the, um, the, the drive to consolidation uh, is going to continue. Whether that is a good thing or a bad thing depends on the extent to which those of us who sort of are face-to-face -face taking care of, of, of patients are willing to make sure that that consolidation ends up with more efficient care, higher quality care, more patient-centered care. Um, and I do believe there is the potential for, um, for practices which are more integrated and can pull in more resources to do all, all of those things better, but it's only a potential. Uh, and it remains to be seen if, that'll, if that will happen. Uh, many of you work in this field and have uh, in this space. Any, anyone else have any comments or thoughts about, about Papa Bear's question? I wish I knew the answer to that question. Because what concerns me and what I, I feel what I'm seeing in our community is a lot of physicians do get together, do try and consolidate services, provide more integrated care, and then um, someone comes along and says, would you like to monetize your practice either private equity or insurance company? Yeah. So, and a lot of people are saying, sure, I'd like to, I've been in practice 25 years, I'd like that nice check. And you're now working for a corporate system following corporate policy, and may have lost control on how medical medicine is practiced yep. because the hospital wants to yep. keep costs down. Yep. Let me just say I work for the biggest healthcare system in the country. Does everybody know that? The VA is far and away the biggest healthcare system in the country. And um, part of the reason it's the biggest is because it has a sort of a uniquely complicated set of objectives and goals. But, but, I, but I do believe that um, size doesn't necessarily have to automatically uh, imply a whole series of negative things. It turns out in practice it often does, but um, the challenge is how we manage that balance, I think. Uh, I, I have a question, I, a the theoretical question here at, at Brown, right? So I personally lived under three um, healthcare systems. Um, 
in three different countries. So uh, just comparing them and, and, and looking at it where we are here in, the, in, in, in this country, right? So is there anything we can learn from others to actually build a better healthcare system? Or what are your thoughts on like the best healthcare system possible? Who would have built it from scratch from now? Great. Ron, that's a simple one. Do you want to yeah, no. have any thoughts? Well, well, it's a great question. And, um, and there's, there are definitely things that I think we can learn. So I guess the, the, first, the, the first question is financing. You know, how, do you, how, how do you finance it? And, is that, and can, we, can we stay with the current model of financing or some sort of hybrid model that we, that we're, that we flirt with? Or do we need to have one payer um, or, or a handful of payers? So I guess that's, that starts there. But then even on the delivery side, I think there are the role of primary care uh, needs to be re, we need to think about it differently, I think, in this country. And we can learn that and that's, those, are, those are easy lessons to learn from other places. So as a provider, I'll kick it back to, to Ira. You know, look, I'm, what I want to say is not what you're going to expect, and, 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 but I want you to think. I make you think. So um, it's very easy to say, you know, Sweden does this, Denmark does this, France does this, you know, Hong Kong does this, um, Singapore does this, and, and we should all do those things. And there are, of course, lots of things we can learn from different countries around the world. However, one of the things that is really complicated and very interesting is that taking something from somewhere else and grafting it onto a culture yeah. is very hard. And we have a very complicated culture. And part of the things, that, what's complicated about our culture is Americans are very market-oriented, and we are very private-oriented. Um, so the whole idea, a lot of the best ideas that come from other countries actually really require kind of single-payer centralized approaches. And you can ask yourself, and you all who are uh, in, in the system can ask yourself, how likely is that to happen in this country? And therefore, how likely are we to be able to sort of ad adapt those kinds of things to our system? And so the, th the thing is, I think you, you have to pay a lot of attention to culture as well as just kind of like the thing or the method or the financing approach or the delivery system approach. It's really very interesting because um, our culture is pretty interesting in this country. Just look at our vaccinations <laughs> for so COVID. There, there, were, there were a series of articles that were, or a series of podcasts actually that were done by the Commonwealth Fund a few years ago where they... They're talking to researchers who are in the United States who are from another country who've had some interaction with the U.S. healthcare system and ask them, how would this get handled in your country, whether it's Netherlands, France, um, Canada, uh, the U.K.? And then they, then they also ask them, what do they think about um, their, their healthcare system home, at home versus what they experienced in the U.S.? And most of them... Well, most of them responded that they preferred the, their health care system from home, from a, primarily from a cost basis. But if they had something that was very exceptional, very rare, they really wanted to be in the United States. So there's, a, there's this, no, this notion that, that innovation happens in the U.S., but um, sort of your routine fractures and um, routine medical care is much better under the models that are experienced in their, in their host countries. For, for students that are sort of interested in this comparative um, question, I always recommend sending the links to that series of podcasts. But it's a, it's a great question, and the, and the whole premise for that series of podcasts is what, what can the U.S. learn from other places? We should, we should probably stop, but let me just add one more thing, which is that um, if you want to ask the question, where is innovation happening in the United States right now? The answer is in states. Right? States are doing a lot of very innovative things. And, and one of the things that's fascinating is that the culture of state A and the culture of state B are often completely different. So Oregon, for example, is doing a lot of innovative things. I don't know if there's anyone here from Oregon. Rhode Island has actually, uh, in the past decade, done some very innovative things. Um, 
but the applicability of those things to other states is often limited for all kinds of reasons. So that's another sort of microcosm that you can use to examine the question of how do you take, how do you identify best practices, and then how do you take them from context A and put them in context B, which is, which is um, obviously one of the things we would like to do. Anyway, thank you so much for letting us uh, teach your children, uh, and have a good weekend.